Hi everyone, welcome to a live Q&A session. And I'm indoors today because it's snowing and it's very beautiful. I can look out the window and uh, the snow is falling. It's, it's quite attractive. It Maybe the last time we have snow here. And uh, so yes, uh, everybody, thanks for joining in and uh, welcome. Uh, of course, feel free to ask any questions about photos, about editing, about apps. I'm always happy to help out, so uh, feel free. There's a little question mark icon below. Just press it and feel free to ask any question. And uh, uh, give a little wave here. Thanks for joining, every joining in, everyone. And what I'll do is uh, each time that I do this, there's, uh, there's always people who, who uh, text or direct message me with questions because they missed the Q&A session. Well, I'm going to try to do these Q&A sessions at a consistent time every day, which is 12 noon Toronto, Canada time. And that's called AST or Atlantic Standard Time. So check back tomorrow, we'll do the same thing. Welcome everybody. So uh, the first question that uh, came from yesterday and I didn't get a chance to uh, fit it into the live Q&A session was about um, creative, okay, here's the question. I don't understand Adobe's creative cloud pricing or options for Lightroom. Can you explain? Okay, so it is a little bit tricky to, if, let's just say that you're wanting to get into Lightroom CC or even Lightroom Classic or maybe even Photoshop and there's so many actual different options when you go to take a look at what they have. There's price points of like $9.99 a month and there's like $14.99, et cetera, et cetera. And what I advise people to do, if they're not uh, so much needing Photoshop is only get what's called the Lightroom package. And the Lightroom package will give you Lightroom CC and also Lightroom Classic, and it's for $9.99, it's a good deal, and it gives you a certain amount of storage space in the cloud. And then when you want to upgrade to include Photoshop, well, it's very simple, you just upgrade later, but I suggest that you start low, and that will help you both keep uh, your, uh, your budget, and also um, it just gives you everything you need within Lightroom, and usually people get away with 90% of their photo editing with Lightroom only. So that's a very good question. Okay, uh, let me press the question mark button here. Do you teach one-on-one -on -one online? And this is from Vastu Marco. Uh, good question. You know, I've tried it in the past and um, let's just say the answer is yes. And uh, Vastu Marco, if you want to send me a direct message after this live Q&A, uh, maybe we can work out something. It's something that I haven't really uh, published or made known that uh, I do one-on-one -on -one sessions with people. However, um, maybe I should start doing that, especially because we are in this uh, this sort of uh, scenario where a lot of us are indoors and we have maybe a lot more time on our hands. Very good question. Thank you. Okay, just let me scroll through here and see if we have anything else. Sorry. I'm just asking myself a question here by mistake. Uh, okay. What's the best camera to buy in your opinion? Budget of 550 euros. Now my guess, um, is that, what is that in American dollars? I have xe.com, <laughs> but is that around 600 or 500 American dollars? If so, I would advise the Fujifilm X-T100. And I believe that's in that price range of 550 euros, the X-T100. And that's a really great camera for a really good price. Now, if you, uh, if you are maybe comfortable with Nikon, try any of the M series, the new M, uh, the mirrorless series. And also the Z50, I think is actually more, more than that. So that's uh, Nikon's Z50. Maybe, maybe that's a, a bit pricier, but yeah, just check, check out the, any of the X series from Fujifilm, especially the X-T100. That's what I would advise. Very good question. Hi everybody. For those who have just joined, welcome. 
feel free to ask any questions that you want. And thanks for, uh, okay, Forest Hill T, hello, how are you? I'm doing really good, thank you. Especially as I get to uh, connect with all of you guys. And uh, yeah, $600 um, is 550 euros. You, you will be within that range. And don't forget, is if that you are looking for a specific camera or a brand and you don't have the budget, you're off by $100, just buy used. There's nothing wrong with buying used. In fact, if you are living in the States, in America, you have so many great options for used camera stores. And I would advise, uh, because it's coming from a reputable camera store, they're going to check the camera and often they will give you even their own used warranty, which is really good as well. Okay, and uh, message from SRK. How are you, sir? I'm great. I appreciate it. Hopefully you're doing well. Feel free to ask questions by tapping the little question mark that's below. Okay, welcome Prashant. Second question that I didn't get to yesterday. The um, how, one of the questions was how do you combine a couple pictures for, for an Instagram or Facebook upload if you just want one upload? Well, that's a really good question. I use uh, an app called Instagram Layout, or sorry, Layout by Instagram. And I think that if you're searching for it on the Google Play Store or the iOS App Store, it's just called Layout. But, uh, and you'll be able to see if the author or the creator is called Instagram. And I find this a really simple way. Like for example, if you look at my Instagram page, the past five or six have been uh, posts where I want to show the before and after. And, if, and as you can see, I've been collecting the, uh, the before shots all in one image by using layout. And I think it's pretty good. So keep that in mind. If you guys want to upload any of your social media images, you can use layout or there's a hundred apps for layout. They're all really good. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Hi Mark, I have a Nikon D5600 with an 18 to 140 VR lens. Will this lens support teleconverter or purchase a different lens? Uh, yes, it will actually. And what I advise for a maximum communication, electronically speaking, between your lens and your Nikon is that you get a teleconverter by Nikon. Now it's true that uh, there are third-party companies that will offer teleconverters, but I don't really suggest that. I would suggest you get a Nikon teleconverter and especially the 2X, not the 1.5X, because the 2X, if you're gonna get a teleconverter, you might as well get the maximum. And that will give you a 140 times two. So by doing the math, we have a 280 millimeter lens and it's, uh, it's gonna work out well. Now, I don't know if VR is supported with teleconverters in Nikons. I assume that it is. Great question. Okay. I found a Canon 60D with a 28 to 80 lens. Is that also good? Yes, it is. Now the 60D, uh, I think is, is perfectly fine. And the 28 to 80, if you're getting a good price for it, then by all means, get it. Yeah, it's, uh, and the nice thing is you can't really lose these days. We're in a, a great position in uh, the world of photography where there's so much excellence, regardless if uh, you have uh, a, a consumer version, a prosumer or a professional camera, they all take amazing photos these days. So no problem. Yes, if it's used, then you're gonna get a good deal. So definitely do that. Just make sure that if you're buying it privately, that you get a chance to maybe spend an hour photographing it. Make sure you download those pictures into your computer or your iPad or tablet and just make sure that you like the look of it and that the lenses are not scratched. And uh, yeah, if, maybe if, you, um, if you're not too comfortable with uh, assessing the quality of a used camera, then maybe bring a friend along who's a, a pro or a semi-pro. But I'm sure that you can figure that out uh, just by looking. By the way, if you're want, wanting to know the quality of a lens, hold the lens up to the sky and look through it on both ends and just look, look for any dust, mold, scratches. Okay, uh, Forest Hill T, what is your advice for product photography for beginners? Yes, so um, 
this is what I advise is that you use your large window make sure that there's no sun direct sun coming in so that you'd be looking for an overcast day like today for example where I am and uh, or a, a north facing window that would also work so you're in the shadow and also get a piece of Bristol board and that's that white reflective board that you can buy at a dollar store or an art store and that Bristol board will reflect light back onto the dark side of your product and photograph at a 45 degree angle use aperture priority go to f8 or f11 use a, a teleconverter or zoom a, a telephoto or zoom lens and use your exposure compensation dial to make your picture brighter or darker depending on the subject matter make sure that the background is appropriate to your subject and that usually is a sort of a, uh, a complementary color or if you're looking for a bold scenario you're looking for a, a, an opposing color something that really jars the viewer and those are the those are the parameters I would suggest for starting out in product photography excellent question okay let's scroll down here go to the question mark um, Jeff says would you do a camera and lens list from Amazon perhaps to help us the new to know the best deals that's a good idea actually and usually what I advise people if they ever struggle to um, you know come up with uh, a new camera they want to buy a new camera uh, and they ask me mark what is the best camera for me well that's really hard for me to assess so I usually ask what what is your budget because you should always have a budget before you buy anything in photography set it and don't go above it and that really helps you to be to actually do more homework so I ask people what is your budget and what is your favorite type of photography and I'm usually able to help out with that so feel free okay I'm gonna go back to the little question mark uh, can you do a camera list perhaps from Amazon yes okay I just answered that and it's uh, yeah it's definitely a good idea and I should probably even do that for for you all with regards to specific genres and also uh, budgets and I do say that I think that the best the best uh, camera right now for a low price point is the XT100 by Fujifilm uh, of course uh, you know what does it matter they're all so good they're all very good these days okay welcome everybody the new people we're doing a Q&A session and I invite you to ask any questions at all about photography and another question from yesterday uh, Mark I have the opportunity and the budget to buy a 50 millimeter for my Canon I notice that the f1.2 is expensive but uh, I assume good quality and there's also a 1.4 f1.4 as well what do you advise okay so this is a really good question and if anyone has the has the money and the budget to go into the L series of lenses from Canon well they're they're of course very good for one exception I had a Canon 1.2 uh, f1.2 lens from Canon and I tell you it was just a waste of money it was it was pathetic because at f1.2 nothing was sharp except a small circle in the middle and I was thinking you know what I could get better results with the far cheaper f1.4 and save a huge amount of money because in the end I didn't even use the f1.2 when I was using that Canon lens because it was so bad I would actually shoot at f1.4 or f1.8 to make the 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 perimeter of the picture sharp so if that's what I'm doing why bother with such an expensive L series lens and I just want to advise you is that when you're all of us want to have better quality equipment but it's not always wise because that extra amount that you're paying may not actually pay off with regards to the extra abilities you're getting so just be careful of that don't always feel tempted to buy the latest greatest professional series equipment if you don't need it that's my advice okay hey everybody welcome 
For those who have just joined, we're doing a Q&A session. Nabil says hi everyone and we uh, say hello back. Jesus M. G. Amez sent a request to be live in your video. If that was uh, a mistake, just cancel. I'm going to say yes to that. And uh, some people press that by mistake. They don't want to be live. But if you want to be live to ask your question, uh, I'm happy to do so. And he declined. That's perfectly fine. So just FYI, everybody. There's two little, I think, two little icons, two happy faces. If you want to join me live, press that button. If you don't want to join me live, don't press that button. But I suggest that you ask your questions in the little question mark icon, which is below. And Noor Hamoud says, Hi, dear. All the love from Lebanon. Well, um, I send that love back to you. I appreciate you joining. Noor Hamad, I have watched all your amazing videos. Well, I appreciate that. I'm really happy to help out. Uh, Yusuf, uh, yes, people argue about if there's any big difference between F1.4 and Despicable and something, the Nifty 51.8. That's a really good question as well. Let me answer that. I was talking about the F1.2 compared to the F1.4, and the 50 millimeter lens is really good for everybody. And if you're saying, well, what if I choose the really inexpensive F1.8? Am I going to be missing out on anything? The answer is no. You have a very inexpensive lens that's very good, and it's very lightweight, it's small, it's unobtrusive. It's not certainly not a theft risk, or at least uh, less so than bigger lenses. I suggest that the 50 millimeter F1.8 is a great introduction to prime lenses. And prime lenses, of course, are lenses that don't zoom. So if you're saying, you know, I have a budget, I don't want to spend too much money, but I want to get into prime lens photography, the 50 millimeter, millimeter F1.8 is a gem. I truly suggest it. Yusuf, thanks for uh, adding that. I appreciate it. Welcome everyone who's new. Welcome. You can uh, ask any questions below. I suggest in the question mark box below. And uh, let's pull up another question here. Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for these uh, sessions. Greatly appreciated. This is from Soulful Lens. I'm happy to help anytime. I'm uh, happy that you guys joined. Okay. Um, so next question. Lightroom. Okay. This is from yesterday as well. What am I getting from the Lightroom CC apps premium version where I have to pay each month compared to the Lightroom CC app that's free? Thanks for your response. Okay, I'm happy to help. And the reason why I'm happy to help is, is because I use Lightroom CC every day, the app and of course the desktop version. And the free version is actually really good. You get so much ability to do great editing with the free version. However, what I really love doing is what's called selective editing. And that's where I can adjust certain aspects of the picture, tonally, saturation, color, clarity, and I can leave the rest alone. Now, let me give you an example. If you could take a look at the situation I have behind me, these mountains, <laughs> if I wanted to make them brighter or darker, but not affect my face in Lightroom with the premium edition, which you have to pay for each month, I could paint all of the mountains, just the mountains, leave my face and my upper body alone. And I can make those mountains darker or brighter or anything I want and not affect anything else. This is called selective editing. And it's a really valuable tool within the Lightroom CC app for Android and iPhone. And yes, you do have to pay for it. However, what I suggest people do, because it is a bit scary to lock yourself into a monthly $7 a month plan or whatever. However, the good thing is, is that you can go month by month. So, you know, a lot of us will buy, you know, an expensive Starbucks latte, super latte for $7. <laughs> so why not invest in like the, the equivalent of two coffees or whatever, for one month of using Lightroom CC Mobile Premium version and then cancel. There's no problem with that. And the advantage is that you get to try out uh, the creative tools that are offered within the selective editing um, abilities. They're really quite amazing. 
And in reverse, I could just paint my own face and adjust only my face, but leave the background alone. And if you want to, uh, if that is something that appeals to you, then uh, give it a go and then cancel later on. It's no problem. Okay, that was a great question. And uh, for those who just joined, uh, feel free to ask any questions by pressing the question mark below. Okay, so we have Nabil. How to recognize at first look between a photo taken in APS-C and full frame? That's a great question. It's very difficult, actually. The only way that I can actually tell the difference between a photo taken in a full frame camera and what's called an APS-C or a smaller sensor or a smaller frame camera is by the amount of depth of field or what we call shallow depth of field. Now, if you have a full frame camera and you have a, a lens that has a very low f-stop number, we would say a fast lens, let's say f1.8 or 1.4, and you take a portrait of a person, the background is gonna be very blurry. This is attractive, this is a good thing, especially for portraiture. Now, let's just say that we had another camera, which is a smaller sensor camera, APS-C, and we use the exact same lens, the exact same person, the background would have less blur behind it. That is because a full frame camera allows for more blur behind a person and an APS-C sized or smaller sized or crop sensor camera has less blur. Now you'd say, well, wouldn't it be good for all of us to have a full frame camera. Well, that's not necessarily the case. If you think about it the other way, if you're a landscape photographer, then you're actually going to have the opportunity to potentially to have more depth of field in your pictures because your sensor is smaller. So if you're a portrait photographer primarily, you may consider <coughs> that, excuse me, that a full frame camera is better suited to you because you can get that super thin or narrow slice of depth of field. The, f the eyes are sharp, but the rest, everything else is blurry. This is good. If you're a landscape photographer, you may find that the APS-C, the cheaper cameras, are actually better for you. That's the only way I can figure out the difference. Really good question. question. Thank you. Okay, let's see what else we have here. How can I make the water blurry? And how can I do the painting light in my picture, sir? I love that question. So here, if you are taking notes, here is the recipe. And by the way, this recipe is in Digital Camera Mastery Online Photography Course that is at markhemmings.com. And I go in great detail about how to photograph waterfalls, how to do light trail paintings, and also in my course, Photo Shortcuts. And these two courses explain these techniques. Actually, Photo Shortcuts does a better job of light painting. And these are at markhemmings.com. What I advise people to do is only photograph it at dusk or dawn. Use an ND filter or a polarizer filter. Go to aperture priority. Choose the, the highest f-stop number possible, which is f22 or f32, depending on your lens. Choose the lowest ISO possible and adjust your exposure using your exposure compensation. Use a tripod and I guarantee you it's going to work. And also that will, that will work uh, as well for light painting. And when I'm talking about light, light painting, I'm usually referring to the great photos of um, headlights and taillights as they go by on a highway or in a cityscape or something like that. But that, that will also work for light painting if you're doing uh, really cool stuff with colored flashlights. Okay, so if, that, if you need more help with that, the two courses, Photo Shortcuts and Digital Camera Mastery, are at my website, markhemmings.com. Great question. Okay, for all of you who just joined up, um, I'm going to be uh, probably wrapping this up soon as I am looking forward to eating lunch. Haven't eaten yet. So uh, what I'll get you guys to do is just uh, throw out a few more questions if you have any. If not, we will uh, say goodbye and we'll redo this 
tomorrow. And uh, the last question that I had that I didn't get to from yesterday's posting had to do, actually had to do with APSC as well. And uh, APSC, for those who don't know, is a smaller sensor. So if you look, if you take the lens off your camera, it would be a DSLR or mirrorless, obviously. The size of that little rectangle dictates the, uh, the, the type of camera. So a bigger sized sensor that you can actually physically see with your eyes when you flip your lens, lens or sorry, when you flip the mirror up, is called full frame. A smaller sensor is called APS-C, and a smaller sensor still is called micro four thirds. Those are three types of sensor sizes. And a lot of people get confused and they ask me all the time is what's the difference? And the micro four thirds camera system has the smallest sensor and you might say, well, why bother? Why, why would I get that if I'm getting a smaller sensor? Well, similarly, I mentioned this a, a few minutes ago, is that the smaller the sensor, the more opportunity for a very large amount of depth of field. So that means that landscape photographers may be inclined to get an, a, a micro four thirds camera so that they can actually have quite a large amount of, uh, of items sharp both in front of the camera and way off in the distance. So keep that in mind. Okay, question mark. Um, okay, let's see what we have here. Shooting at a large moon, what's the best lens and what would be the best settings? Yeah, so uh, I missed the large moon, the, the pink moon as they call it the other night. And uh, essentially it doesn't matter what type of lens as long as it's a long zoom. So if you have any type of zoom, obviously you're going to want to zoom in. You can consider purchasing for the next super moon what's called a, uh, a teleconverter, a 2x teleconverter, which would make any lens double the telephoto view, which is really good. And because the moons are so bright, you can actually make sure you use a tripod, but you can actually make use a lower ISO and your, your aperture, sh I would suggest f8, aperture priority, just let the shutter speed be whatever it needs to be, it doesn't matter. And maybe you'd want to start out with an ISO of 800 and then see it from there, but to be honest, um, you could probably even get away with an ISO of 100 or the lowest ISO for maximum quality because you are using a tripod. So uh, give that a go. So I'll just repeat that for moon photography. Aperture priority, f8, um, try the lowest ISO for the best quality, but because of that, you may want to make sure that you're using a two second time or five second timer, just so that you don't shake your camera when you pr press the shutter. And also you're probably going to want to underexpose the picture a little bit using exposure compensation dial. And that's to the minus side. And that will help you get the detail in the shot in, in the moon that you want. Don't ever allow the moon to be what, what's called blown out. That's pure white. You want to reduce the exposure so you can see the detail in the moon. And then you can crop in really tight to just the moon and post it on social media. And the reason why that's okay is because the resolution of social media is so small that let's just say that you're using a 24 megapixel camera. Well, social media often only, actually, it's, they reduce the images as if you were shooting with a two or three megapixel camera. So that's quite amazing. You can do amazing amount of cropping there and still have really good detail. Very good question. Hello, everyone who just joined up. Um, wow, the skin tone just changed for some reason. Sorry about that. Okay, I'm just waving at you guys, and obviously it's changing the exposure compensation. Um, let's go to this next question that we have here. Yusuf says, sorry if I missed anybody, hopefully I'm just scrolling. And by the way, if you guys, it's better from, easier for me if you can press the little question mark button down below if you have any questions. Uh, that way I don't have to scroll. Hello, Mark. I want to make a shootout to the great video I watched just before I bought my DSLR. 
it's about having the most from your kit lens and you really convinced me that I should stick with my 18 to 55. Good question. Thank you, Yusuf. Yeah, it's, I don't advise that people ever look down on the kit lens. Now it's true that kit lenses are not as high quality as other lenses, but I have found by testing kit lenses that anything that's about three years uh, up to, uh, anything that's within a three or four year period, you're gonna get really good results. And the quality keeps getting better and better. And I'll, I'll give a good shout out to Fujifilm. Their kit lenses are inexpensive and they are truly amazing for being a kit lens. So don't be afraid of kit lenses. In fact, I would say it's foolish not to buy a kit lens when you're buying a camera body because the kit lens is usually half the price if you buy it with the camera body than if you buy that lens separately. Therefore, it's very economically sound and wise for you to buy a kit lens with the camera body when you're buying new. Great question. Okay, Mark 2605, great to see and hear your calm and clear instructions. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm happy to help. Uh, 19, Wiza, I'm having a hard time using my old Nikon D40. Any tips, please? Yes, um, what is the difficulty? If you can just give us a little bit more information on what you're struggling with, I might be able to help you. And, uh, you know, the D40 is getting a little bit old. Um, and if it, are you struggling with uh, focus or exposure, just uh, let us know. We'll try to uh, help out there. Okay, let's see what else we have. What should be a manual setting for indoor photography? I'm having problems with lighting. Yeah, it's very difficult, indoor photography, and a lot of us are stuck, of course, inside, and uh, it's, it's very tricky. I would suggest, um, with regards to a manual setting, is that you, depending on the lens, I would say don't ever go below one over 250, or one 250th of a second in your shutter speed. So if you're gonna be shooting in manual, I would say that probably you're looking at f5.6 to make sure that you have the person and the background, or at least the person sharp. If you are photographing just one person, go to the lowest f-stop number possible. If you're photographing a couple people or a couple things, go to f5.6. If you go to f8, you're going to be really struggling to get light. Therefore, your ISO, your ISO has to be extremely high. And because a lot of us don't have too much lighting, natural lighting coming into our houses, especially if it's an overcast day, don't be afraid to increase that ISO dramatically. Increasing your ISO, it will be necessary to photograph indoors. Now, this is not the case if you're using a tripod. If you're using a tripod and you can have that person totally still, or better yet, if it's a product or, or a still life, then keep the lowest ISO possible. But if it's a moving person, high ISO is best. Okay, um, so everybody, I'm just going to uh, probably uh, say goodbye fairly soon because this Instagram only has uh, a 60 minute limit. And um, okay, one more here. Hello there, form where I get good online photography course. Oh, from where? Well, I suggest markhemmings.com, <laughs> my own website. And that's M-A-R-K-H-E-M-M-I-N-G-S.com. And I have four photography courses that will help you a lot. And one of them is called Digital Camera Mastery. This is for learning about your DSLR or your mirrorless camera. The second one is called Lightroom Editing Mastery to help you master Lightroom to edit your photos and store them. The third one is called Photo Shortcuts, and this is a, a really good uh, course, online course, to help you get exactly what you need for every genre. And the fourth one is, is uh, iPhone Art Academy, and that helps you create cool looking um, photos with your, you know, molding and mixing two or three photos together, just like I've been doing the past five days on my Instagram feed. So give that a go, markhemmings.com. Okay, let's see what else, and then I'll, this will probably be my last question, and it's time to go eat lunch. Uh, I tried vlogging with DSLR. I work with P mode or manual, but the camera just can't get it because the lighting varies from indoors to outdoor shadows. I use auto, and it blows out the image in transition. Yes, that's absolutely right. 
Yusuf. And that's very difficult because cameras have a hard time, especially in video mode, uh, transitioning well from indoors to outdoors. So indoors, it's jacked up, the ISO is high. And then if you walk out, which is often the case for real estate agents, suddenly the camera is struggling. It's like panicking and it's, uh, how do I deal with all this light that just flooded in? And your face will be blown out and uh, it, it's just a huge mess. Now, eventually within about two or three seconds, it should come back to normal exposure but it does, there is a transition period that is unavoidable and there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to live with it. And if you're, if you're doing this for a profession, say for example, you're a, you're a real estate agent, just, you'll have to say, um, by the way, sorry for this uh, transition, my face is uh, pure white, but it'll fix itself. And uh, now that's not the case with really expensive video cameras, but it is the case for most of our vlogging, our less expensive DSLRs and mirrorless cameras? Very good question, by the way. Uh, do vloggers usually change their settings on every shoot, don't they? Now, uh, that's, I, f I don't think they do, to be honest, because vloggers really need to make sure that they are not fiddling with settings while they're live. Or if they're not live, um, obviously when they're doing um, recordings, to uh, upload to YouTube or whatever. I think they just keep it on auto, at least that's what I advise people to do, is just keep it on auto. And you'll have to, you'll have to just uh, ride out that transition period of super bright to super dark, and there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, so everybody who just joined, uh, I was doing a Q&A session, I'm going to uh, hang up very soon, and I just want to tell you guys that I've decided uh, because you guys have uh, suggested it, that uh, there's a definitive time for me to do these Q&A sessions. And 12 noon is what I'm going to try to go for every day. And that would be 12 noon Toronto time. Now, that's called AST, Atlantic Standard Time. And uh, I will also put a little, um, I'll upload a little you know, uh, image to my Instagram and Facebook saying, I'm going to go live today. And if I do miss a day, um, which I probably won't because I'm indoors every day, <laughs> I'm not out doing photo shoots, that's for sure. Then certainly I will, uh, I, I will let you guys know that yes, I'm on for noon Toronto time. Okay. Thanks everybody. Um, before I go, what image quality settings would you recommend? There must be another question here. Uh, okay, one more. I have a long question regarding shooting moon last night. Can you ask, can you ask in your private message? Uh, yes, you can. Okay, everybody, thank you for joining me. Uh, let's check back tomorrow. Noon, Toronto AST, Atlantic Standard Time. I'm very glad that you joined me. And uh, all the best with your photography. And uh, I hope you guys do well in this time of being inside your house. By the way, if you want some inspiration on what to do to stay creative, take a look at my Instagram page, my Facebook page, and the last five or six posts have been images that I've created just in my own living room, sitting on the couch. And you guys can do the same. And it's a lot of fun going through your archives and mixing pictures together. It allows you to stay creative and to stay sane in these times. Okay, God bless. See you, everybody.